Well, tomorrow it's one week since America voted in the midterm elections of 2014. Colorado elected a United States Senator Cory Gardner, the Republican, to replace incumbent Democrat Mark Udall. Coloradans, <laughs> Coloradans returned their congressional delegation, including uh, the most targeted Republican congressman in the country, Mike Kaufman and seated Ken Buck, Republican of the 4th District, to replace Gardner as he moves up to the U.S. Senate. Coloradans changed the leadership of the state Senate where I once served, Republican, after a decade of Democrat control. They narrowed the margin of Democrat control in the State House of Representatives, and they gave Governor John Hickenlooper more of a run than he expected that he would have, although he was re-elected over a good friend of CCU and Centennial Institute, Bob Beaupre, both honorable men. We're not partisan at Centennial Institute, and I mean that sincerely. I, everybody knows John Andrews is a Republican, and lots of us in this room may identify that way politically, but we've got to look deeper. We've got to understand why it is that political parties even came into being in America when the founding fathers not only did not uh, intend them, but were not particularly warm towards the contribution that political parties might make in the constitutional framework uh, that they gave us. Why do we need political parties? Are two parties better than a multi-party system such as, as Britain and the rest of the Anglosphere and uh, the European countries and most every other nation in the world would have? Important questions and they go below the surface of just cheerleading for this party or that one or demonizing the other one. Our speaker this evening, someone that I've known and admired for a long time, will have some observations about what the change in control of the U.S. Senate meant nationally last week, what it means for Barack Obama or any president under a term-limited eight-year framework of the 22nd Amendment to be entering the final two years when he cannot face the voters again and be vindicated. But he wants to, as I say, take us deeper, challenge us to think about the bedrock. Thomas Jefferson warned that the natural pattern of things is for government to gain and liberty to lose ground. Those of us that stand against that, that identify with constitutional limited government and liberty, individual freedom, personal responsibility, the burden is on us to see how to counteract that tendency. And there's another tendency we have to counteract before we can counteract the, the relentless gain of government, and that is our own tendency to squabble and to come down, break down into tribes and factions amongst those who say more government is not the answer. Dr. Donald Devine has done important work throughout a long distinguished career in practical politics and in political science and uh, academia teaching government and politics, Western civilization. He's authored eight books. He will talk to us in particular tonight about his most recent one called America's Way Back, Reclaiming Freedom, Tradition, and Constitution. The idea of, of a fusion approach that would allow conservatives to find common ground and not fragment and not fight amongst ourselves. An earlier book of his, and one of my very favorite book titles, called Reagan's Terrible Swift Sword. I wrote a book once, it was a terrible book, but his book just has terrible in the title. <laughs> it's a darn good book, and it tells the story of his service as the Director of Office of Personnel Management in the Reagan administration. He had worked on the Reagan campaigns of 76, the very near miss when Reagan almost took the nomination away from an incumbent Republican president, Gerald Ford. And again, the successful Reagan campaign of 80 to best a number of other more favored Republican rivals for the nomination and then unseat President Jimmy Carter after one term in the White House when Reagan came in for those eight years. And the title of that book, Professor Devine took as a badge of honor what some called him out of a sense of uh, not appreciating the work he was doing for President Reagan to 
eliminate 100,000 bureaucrats from the federal rolls and to save $6 billion in taxpayer payroll. They called him Reagan's terrible swift sword and he took it as a, as a badge of honor, cutting on behalf of not just the taxpayer and fiscal responsibility, but on behalf of our freedoms, on behalf of constitutional limited government. He's taught for many years at the University of Maryland, later at Bellevue University. Today he is a vice chairman of the American Conservative Union and He's with us tonight as a senior scholar at a Washington-based group called the Fund for American Studies. You're in for a fascinating evening, not only with his presentation, but with the interaction that he wants to have with CCU students and all of our guests tonight. Please welcome our distinguished guest, Donald Devine. Most of the clocks have most of the classrooms have clocks in the back, don't they? But there is mine. I won't steal it from you. I promise. Uh, my watch just came apart. My hand. Uh, uh, thank you, John, very much for that nice introduction. Uh, although I'm not going to speak on anything he said, pretty much, uh, uh, and that's because he told me. Uh, to change it, but he didn't remember he told me to change it. Because uh, uh, normally what I do is interact with students, and uh, originally uh, uh, we thought it would be mostly uh, uh, elder folk like me, but uh, so I'm going to uh, go back and do a little different. But first, uh, I'll tell you a little uh, about me. Uh, John mentioned it, but. Um, uh, I'm a professor, written eight books, thousands of articles uh, over a very long career, as one can see. Uh, um, but nobody cares about anything that I did on that end. They all only care about Ronald Reagan and that I was the head of the civil service for him. Uh, and I remember when he uh, called me up and said, Don, I got a job for you. I said, what is it? And I said, I want you to be the director of the Office of Personnel Management, OPM. Uh, my son used to call it opium. Uh, uh, um, uh, I said, uh, well, that's kind of a strange job to give a, a limited government uh, uh, conservative like me, uh, the head of the bureaucracy. Uh, and he said, well, I got a good sense of humor. Uh, I said, well, what do you, what do you uh, want me to do? He says, I want you to cut 100,000 federal employees, uh, uh, domestic. Uh, we're going to build up the military side. But I want you to cut 100,000 non-defense employees. I want you to cut their bloated benefits. And I want you to make them work harder. Said thanks a lot. Gonna make a lot of friends in this job. Uh, <laughs> but I always remember what Harry Truman used to say about doing a tough job, and uh, just to be nonpartisan, uh, about doing a tough job in Washington. <clears throat> if you need a friend in Washington, better buy a dog. Uh, somebody ruined my punchline there. But I brought two to be on the safe side. Uh, uh, and we did it. We did cut 100,000. Uh, nobody's ever done that uh, since, uh, the, well, the demobilization after World War II. Nobody else did that. We need to do it again. We did cut $6 billion, but that sounds cheap. It's $60 billion in today's numbers. Uh, uh, and we did make them work harder. We put in a pay for performance system for the executives uh, and the mid-level managers. And I was right. I didn't make any friends. <laughs> that uh, Reagan's terrible swift sword was the front page of the magazine section of the Washington Post. Now, nobody knows the Office of Personnel Management out in the real world. Uh, but in Washington, that's the company business, and everybody knows about it. Uh, so I got on the front, and 
we were, when we were cutting back, we didn't really plan this as well as we should have. Uh, we were cutting back the uh, making the first firings before Christmas. Uh, New York uh, Times, uh, 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 New York <coughs> Times uh, called me uh, the Grinch in the pinstripe suit. Uh, when we cut out the abortion coverage in the Federal Employees Health Program, which is the biggest private. Uh, they called me Daddy Divine, uh, uh, telling uh, women what they're supposed to do. I just didn't want to pay for it. Uh, 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 um, and uh, 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 not everything else was, I guess my favorite was, I was called the Rasputin of the Reduction in Force, which is when you fire people. Now, of course, I like to brag about this, but I had nothing to do with it. Ronald Reagan said, do it, uh, so I did it. Uh, uh, and it was he that uh, inspired me, uh, and he really uh, changed the world. Uh, he's the only president that cut non-defense discretionary spending. Uh, uh, that's what runs the whole government. Uh, uh, on the domestic side, cut it by 9.5 percent over his eight years. Nobody else uh, has done that, uh, uh, at least in modern times. I don't know back in, before they kept good records. 9.5 uh, uh, percent. Everyone else has increased it, uh, and uh, unfortunately, Republicans as well uh, as Democrats. Uh, in fact, more than Democrats uh, on the. Uh, on the uh, discretionary spending. Even including domestic entitlements, Reagan reduced it, not absolutely as he did uh, with uh, uh, discretionary spending, but even including entitlements, he reduced it uh, uh, from 17.4 uh, uh, to 15.6% of gross national product. Uh, one of your professors here uh, mentioned as a uh, in a public fight with uh, uh, two other authors uh, who just did a thing on Reagan, uh, which they uh, they claim he didn't cut anything because uh, yeah, the defense went up. Well, Reagan said it went defense was going to go up, and kind of he won the Cold War. You know, not a bad uh, uh, result from that. Uh, 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 and importantly, without firing a shot. That's the way you should win wars. Uh, uh, there are three great depressions. Oh, oh, economic students here? Only three times in uh, American history, at least in modern times, the uh, stock market, market lost 20% or more of its value over a three-day period. When, you know, everyone knows the first one. Huh? 1929, right? Okay. We know what happened. We put in Keynesian economic theories, primed the prompt, did all that good stuff, and we got it over in 10 years. Huh? Now, all you young people should know when the second one was. You're suffering from it right now, right? It's 2008, uh, not second uh, in terms of uh, time, but the one you should know. No one knows what the third one was. Very few, anyway. I have to do this lecture a million times. Do you, do you know? No? Well, that's closer. Uh, it's actually 1987. It's called Black Tuesday. All right, it in fact marginally went down more than uh, uh, the Great Depression, uh, just a point zero two, but it was a little more. Now, why didn't you ever hear of that? Because it happened when Ronald Reagan was president. He believed in freedom, believed in markets. And when the stock market went down, they all ran to him the same way they did to Franklin Roosevelt and the same way they did to George W. Bush and to uh, Barack Obama. And they all said, got to stimulate the economy, throw, uh, <coughs> throw money at it. Uh, um, 
And by the way, we love that in Washington, where I'm from. We have seven of the richest ten counties in America in there. And when things go bad, we do well. You all send us money. It's great. Right? We don't have any unemployment problems in Washington. So they all came to Reagan and they said, uh, we got to do that. We got to tighten the regulation. They even told him that had to shut down the stock market. And he said, no, we're not going to do it. He said, unless you let the market go down, people will never have the confidence to invest to have it go up. He said that there's a logic to the market. Nobody ever said the market's always up. Market goes up and down. When it goes down, it makes a correction. And if you don't let it make its correction, it doesn't come back. And that's what happened in 1929. That's what's happening today. It may never come back uh, if they never let go of it. I heard uh, uh, um, uh, Reagan's son, uh, Michael Reagan, explain. He said, you know, in 1987, we had a recession as bad as 1929 uh, and, and uh, 2008, and my father did nothing about it, and it worked. The reason no one remembers it, it was gone in two months. He changed the world. 25 years recovery after Reagan's changes. Cut taxes, cut regulations. All right, the mine, that's ancient history. It is, that's all gone. All the changes, the reforms I made were gone by the next administration, which was not a democratic one. We have 16 trillion debt that we count, and 18, uh, uh, 18 trillion debt that we count, and 16 trillion uh, is the national income. I can't continue. And that doesn't count the four trillion stuck in the Federal Reserve. It doesn't count the eight trillion unfunded uh, for Social Security. And it doesn't count the 30 trillion unfunded for Medicare. That's my great generation's gift to you young people. You get to pay it off. I'll be, I'll be long dead by then. Uh, today, the bureaucracy cannot do anything. You just pick up the paper. In my book, I have like 80 examples of it. And just in the past couple of weeks, you have the Centers for Disease Control, uh, uh, saying, uh, giving their little uh, uh, rules and, and, and uh, uh, publishing a book on how to deal with Ebola. On the front cover of that book, it has facts about Ebola, and right next to it says you cannot, in big letters, get Ebola, big letters, through the air, big letters. Now, if you go back into the question and answer section, they ask, uh, they mention that at one stage of Ebola, that uh, you can get sneezing. How do you get sneezing without going through the air? Well, but that's kind of minor when you think of it because. A couple of months before that, they found deadly smallpox vaccine in a cellar that they forgot about for 15 years. They uh, 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 had a flu virus they lost track of. Uh, all right, that's so much for your health. Um, 
The FBI just arrested a guy the other day for uh, fixing the, uh, the samples uh, uh, that they used to convict uh, people. The Internal Revenue Service investigates uh, conservatives before uh, groups before the election so they don't give uh, 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 so they can't participate uh, in the election. Uh, uh, Transportation Security Administration every year runs two or three tests to going through all those machines you got to go through at the airport. Consistently 70 to 80 percent of the weapons get through on their tests. Uh, uh, um, I don't have to mention Obamacare, uh, uh, enormous disaster. Uh, I couldn't implement that. No private company in the world could survive that. Federal Protection Service, a year ago, that's the one that keeps the federal buildings safe. Uh, one of their people brought in a bomb put it in there and stayed there for three weeks. Uh, Paul Light, who is the top public administration professor in the United States, he's a, he's a good progressive uh, liberal, not a conservative, uh, at New York University, he's had many uh, uh, commissions studying the bureaucracy. He says the federal government can no longer faithfully execute its laws. I mean, that is an incredibly damning thing from a person like that. He even has said it hurts him to get out, but he thinks maybe the federal government is doing too much. It is. Why? Because we've lost track of what our constitutional government is about. We don't even know what the Constitution is. Now, I've given this, like I, I lecture a lot to law schools. Uh, uh, do you know the overwhelming majority of lawyers do not read the Constitution. I went to, to Regent University. It was one of the first ones I've been to that said that they had one of their constitutional law professors had their textbook that had uh, <coughs> the Constitution in it. And there's been a couple of others. But by and large, they don't. And why don't they? It's very reasonable why they don't. Because the Constitution is what the court says it is, right? So why read it? Just read what the lawyers and the judges say it is. And think of that. If the Constitution is what they say it is, it is logical not to read it. And they don't. Yeah, they read a phrase or a word or a sentence and then 5,000 pages of what lawyers said that really means. All right, now we have all these bright students here. What is the Constitution? It's got to be something different than just what the judges say it is. Just line up five of those old folk up there at a nine, and whatever they say it is, that's what it is. What is the Constitution? I know some of you have had a constitutional law. What is the Constitution? Yeah. It's a document that provides the construction of checks and balances that created the Republican democracy. All right, that's very good. The, the normal answer to that uh, from... Uh, uh, law students is it's a document that gives the rights for Americans. Why is that an F answer? They had the, the, 
preschool had to take my courses at the University of Maryland. I always told them that. What? The government doesn't grant rights. Okay, but there's even a more obvious reason it makes no sense. If the Constitution talked about our rights, we wouldn't have needed a Bill of Rights. I don't know. Wait a minute. That, that's the, what is the Bill of Rights? Amendments to the Constitution. No. Oh, amendments to the Constitution. Yes, amendments to the Constitution. Now think of it for a minute. How can an amendment to a document be the essence of what the document is? Can't be, all right? That's, that's not what it is. This guy's right. The answer is that it's the institutional structure of the government. Yeah? Could one argue that we've made so many amendments to the Constitution that that's become its essence? It's become its essence because there's so many? Well, I would not say there are that many to begin with. Uh, uh, but there certainly was something there before the Bill of Rights was passed. So that's got to be the basic part of it. Doesn't mean those, uh, don't get me wrong, it doesn't mean the Bill of Rights didn't worth anything, uh, but it's not what the essence of the Constitution is. All right, uh, how many have seen a Constitution? All right, that's good. All right, what is the structure of that Constitution? Now, I can't have the professor answering all these questions here. I, well, come on, the students are supposed to have some of this. Where is the... Okay. You. What does the Constitution look like? It's arranged into sections dealing with each branch of the federal government. That is the best answer I've gotten in years. I went out to lunch with her. I figured out smart she is. That's why I asked her for uh, uh, dinner with her. Uh, look at it. It's made up of articles. There are seven of them, but five of them talk about the institutional structure of what the government is. What's Article One? Legislative branch. Huh? Somebody has legislative branch. Yeah, you friendly with her? Yeah. All right. All right. The legislative branch. All right. You're with her. Sorry. Okay. Wait a minute. Problem. All right. Uh, all right. The first is about the legislative branch. Uh, it's called Congress. I teach this a lot in Washington. Uh, I say, well, it's Congress. <coughs> Go find Congress for me. And they usually say, well, it's over on the hill there on Capitol Hill. Say, no, that's the Capitol. Where's, where's Congress? Why can't you find Congress? Huh? You? Why can't you find it? What is Congress? <clears throat> Not quite sure where you want the question. You got the two branches of the legislative. Ah, that's right. You can find two branches. They're a thing called the House and the Senate. You can find them. There is no Congress except what we call both of them. All right. So here we have this Constitution already. It's dividing up the legislative power. One based on democracy, uh, one person, one vote, basically, and, and the other based on states. Uh, and these two separate bodies have to pass every law, the same word to each one. Uh, we got to get 435 individuals in one place to agree, 100 in the other to agree, and then after they go through and pass each house, then somehow they have to agree together, and then they got to send it back, and they have to agree. All right, so we set up this thing. What's Article 2 about? Now, some of you should be catching on now. All right, executive branch, all right? The president, what's different about that? It's a single person that has. Excellent. All right, it's a single. Actually, there's two. President and the vice president. The vice president's only job is to wait until the president dies. So he, he don't really count. Them, all right. So the president. Right. It's one person. He one vote. He outvotes the the cabinet. He outvotes uh, uh, 
all of his bright people on the staff, one person with the power. And what power he has after all the Congress goes through all this thing, the two houses, every the, the 535 finally agree on something, he can veto it. What a mess. All right, what's Article 3? Judicial. Huh? Judicial, all right. This is the guys who tell you what everything else is about. All right, they solve all the problems. Uh, well, no, they don't exactly, uh, 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 because they uh, 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 they can be impeached by Congress. Uh, uh, Congress can give them no money, uh, although there's a thing in the Constitution that says you can't reduce their salary. Well, just they don't give them any other money. All right. Uh, um, uh, and, and presidents uh, have a lot of leeway in carrying out what they want. All right. Now, here we have the two houses can get together. They finally pass it. The president can veto it. The president signs it. These guys say, no, it's unconstitutional. All right. This is a complicated thing, right? I mean, these people are checking and balancing each other like crazy. All right, what's Article 4? It's about the states. Who said that? That is very rare. Anybody knows that. Very. And yet at the beginning, that was 99% of the government. When the Tocqueville came over to study America in the early 19th century, his job was to try to find out what the, judicial, what the uh, prison system was. Uh, uh, and he went around to one day. We had none. It was all done by a state and local. Uh, uh, um, these states uh, uh, administer a lot of the federal laws, and I guarantee you they administer it differently in Colorado than they do in uh, California or Alabama. All right? uh, they have latitude too. The fifth uh, institution. Almost no one gets. Amendments. All right, good for you. All right. And the reason people usually don't get it is because you don't think of it as an institution, but it is. It's a combination of the others. The president gets no vote on this. The courts get no vote. It's uh, either uh, two-thirds of each house in Congress proposes uh, uh, and three-fourths uh, uh, decide that uh, whether it's passed or not, or two-thirds of the state proposed in three-fourths. All right, now uh, here is this institution set up uh, 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 with all these checks and oh my heaven, how could you get anything done with this? <coughs> well, you say the court can decide. Well, Andrew Jackson had a pretty good answer to that. He, of course, uh, was president. He had been a military officer. He, uh, 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 he spent most of his time uh, fighting uh, Native Americans. Now, when he was president, the Cherokee Nation took uh, a court. Uh, they were uh, uh, a Native American tribe that took property rights very seriously and could prove that they owned this land that the government tried to say they weren't allowed to get rid of, goes up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court uh, said, uh, well, the Cherokees are right, they have it. Well, Jackson said back, he said, I'm not going to move those settlers off that land. Uh, uh, I had to fight to get on the land. Uh, so he said the Supreme Court's made its decision, now let it enforce it. Nobody's afraid of those nine old people on the court there. They are afraid of big marshals coming in with batons and guns, uh, all right? You need the executive branch to, uh, to enforce it. Uh, uh, the president uh, can be enormously powerful, but he, he has checks too. The, the most powerful president was Lincoln. It was followed, uh, uh, the very next president uh, was Andrew Johnson who was the weakest president. Uh, uh, he was impeached for the terrible crime of trying to fire his cabinet. 
Now, if the president can't fire the cabinet, he can't do anything. All right, they failed to convict him because there was one honest uh, uh, senator there uh, who didn't vote on party lines. They needed a two-thirds vote. Uh, but he became a nullity. All right? He couldn't fire his cabinet. The cabinet secretaries ran the executive branch. Congress even overrode the separation between House and Senate. They set up a joint committee uh, called the Reconstruction Committee uh, of both houses, the leadership in both houses. They made the decision with often the cabinet members there, uh, and then they went back to the, their respective houses uh, and just passed the ball by two-thirds vote. Because, of course, the Democrats were mostly gone because they were in the South. It was Civil War. They didn't come back. So here you have Congress being able to check everybody else uh, uh, at this period. Uh, it's so hard to justify this complex form of government that we set up. No intellectual in the history of the world thought it would work. And nobody does now. We're trying to reform it every day. And yet, there's only really, a, and I've been thinking about this many, many years, there's only one thing I can say to justify this thing. It's the oldest constitution in the world. Somehow, this thing works, or worked, for most of our history. And if now you go back to Professor Light again, we cannot any longer faithfully execute our law. Because this system was never made to do everything. How could it possibly, with all these checks and all these things and each of the institutions can come back, it was not made to do all this. What's in Article 1, Section 8? Enumeration of powers. The enumerated power, right? You got a dozen or so, uh, depending on how you break the clause up, you have a dozen or so things the Fed's supposed to do. Other than national events, mostly things we spend money on are not in there. Now, maybe some of them should. You got a reason. Pass an amendment. Add it to Article 1, Section 8. What sums up the Bill of Rights? The statement of power is not explicitly given to the federal government or reserved to the states and the people. In Ronald Reagan's inaugural address, he said, I am not cutting spending primarily to save money. I'm cutting federal spending to return power to the states and the people. That's how this thing worked. It took us from a backwater position in, uh, uh, in colonial times uh, to being the greatest, richest, most successful government in the world by following uh, that, that formula. Few functions of the national government leave the rest of the states, people, private institutions, voluntary associations, local governments, uh, all those institutions uh, of freedom. It is just not possible to hold all the knowledge necessary to run this kind of government. What happened? What happened to change what we were doing was the greatest American intellectual since the founders came along and he looked at our former government and he said something's wrong with it. He's a graduate student. He went to Europe to uh, uh, write his doctoral dissertation. He comes to Prussia and he says, this is how government should work. Look what they have. They have an old age retirement system. They have medical care system for everybody. They have education for everybody. Uh, they have welfare for everybody. They've created a welfare state 
why can't America do that? Well, in Prussia, if the king wants it, it happens. What America needs is power brought together to do good things. He comes back, he writes that dissertation, it's still uh, in many political science uh, graduate courses. Uh, he comes back and he writes, the fundamental default uh, of the, the, the American government is that it separates power rather than bring power together to do good. He writes this. He starts the American Society for Public Administration. He starts the American Political Science Association. He's instrumental in starting the American Economic Association, the American Psychological Association. He turns intellectual opinion in the United States around 180 degrees. From going for the belief that the separation of powers is what made the Constitution great to saying that's what its problem is. Who was that? Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson. Very good. Uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson uh, became president of Princeton University. Uh, couldn't get much more prestigious than that. Governor in New Jersey, president of the United States for two terms. He starts all of the major uh, institutions of our present crisis. The Federal Reserve System, uh, uh, Federal Trade Commission, uh, 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 Antitrust Division of the Justice Department. He does the first uh, uh, major spending uh, uh, and regulation of the biggest business of the day, agriculture. Uh, uh, he starts this whole thing, an, an enormously important person and unfortunately uh, not nearly as well known as, as he should be. He changed America and every president since him other than the two immediately following him who tried to move back, uh, Harding and Coolidge uh, and Ronald Reagan, other than those three, every president has bought his idea. Probably Republicans and uh, Democrats. But if the problem is that the government can't uh, uh, perform its basic functions, as Professor Light says, because it's doing too much, it seems to me the answer is pretty simple. Do less. The choice of your generation is really, to me, very simple. Either give the progressives what they want. They want to get rid of these divisions, not weaken them. Now, clearly, they have weakened Congress. They have weakened uh, the states. Uh, 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 they want it all the way. In fact. Gardner Murdoch, one of the, the founders of the welfare state movement, uh, was saying back then that the problem is people don't trust us enough to give the power we need to do everything. All right, so the first choice you have, and it may be the one that is chosen by your generation, I don't know. The first is to give them the power in the presidency and the courts where they want it well removed uh, uh, from any local attachment to institutions. That's one solution. The second solution is the one we're doing right now, which is uh, not to make any decisions. All right? To keep everything the federal government does when we know it doesn't work, but keep doing it. And sooner or later, it's going to be bankruptcy or worse. The third possibility and choice for your generation is return to the Constitution. Put the Tenth Amendment in front of you as the guide. 
Now, are you going to get rid of every federal program? No. In fact, I'm as pragmatic enough to say, let's put Social Security and Medicare in Article 1, Section 8. I, I wouldn't prefer to have the national government, I like it private or something, but give that function to them. First of all, they're the ones that spend it. Why not make them pay it off? Uh, all right. But let's make part of that deal. And Reagan did talk about things like this is making, he, he tried to uh, give 40 uh, welfare programs to the state in return for the feds is going from 50 to 100 percent of Medicaid. Uh, um, uh, make a deal. We'll put Social Security and Medicare into the Constitution, isn't it? Then let's return the rest of that if that isn't in Article One, Section Eight, back to the states and the people. What can the national government do other than national defense? Uh, maybe one or two other things. Uh, uh, that the state can't do, or local government, or private, or uh, association, corporations. We got a million ways to, to solve problems. Uh, Ronald Reagan said, federalism is the secret of America's success. Lord Acton, the great historian, said, the American contribution to separation of powers which equals freedom is federalism. Uh, that, I think, of course, is mine and Ronald Reagan's choice. And I'll just finish off now with my last cabinet meeting, uh, uh, as happens uh, in, in the real world. Uh, we, we were starting to add back on to those 100,000 we got rid of. Uh, uh, and so Reagan asked me to give a uh, talk to the cabinet and uh, dress them down, go department by department, embarrassing them with who was adding so much back. And, uh, and uh, when I was finished, uh, you know, President Reagan uh, was very thoughtful and quiet. And when the president's quiet in the Oval Office, it's quiet. I can tell you that. Uh, everybody's waiting. Uh, uh, and uh, Reagan says, you know, I don't know any country that's gone this far down the road from that America uh, Alexis de Tocqueville talked about and has come back. Now, that was a real downer. But I knew Ronald Reagan, and I knew he wasn't going to end there. Uh, his favorite story was about this optimistic uh, kid who Whatever went on, it was great. We're fine. Everything's okay. Uh, uh, and his mother and father were talking, and they said, uh, this kid's going to get eaten apart by the world when he goes out into it. He's uh, so uh, happy, lucky on everything. We've got to teach him a lesson. And the mother says, well, what? And the father says, well, let's not give him anything for Christmas. And she says, that's kind of drastic. And he says, well, I think, do you have a better idea? And she said, no. Well, all right. So comes Christmas morning, the kid comes running down the stairs. He's all excited. And he looks and he says, there's no tree. There's no presents. You're not cooking anything. There's nothing for Christmas. And dad says, yeah, that's right. And he appeals to mom. He said, there's got to be something. It's Christmas. You can't do that. He says, well, I, your father thinks you, this is the only way you're going to learn. So he turns back to his father. He says, this can't be true. You've got to give me something. All right, well, you've got one thing, and this is it. It's behind the door there. Well, the kid goes and opens the door. It's full of manure. He says, what do you mean manure? He says, that's all you're getting. Well, the kid's sitting there for a while, and all of a sudden, a big smile comes on his face. He runs out of the room. He r runs in with a shovel and starts shoveling. And, and uh, <laughs> he starts shoveling like crazy. And, and the father said, what? What, is, what are you, out of your mind? You're getting uh, manure, and that's it. He said, listen, Dad, with all that manure down there, 
there's got to be a pony under there somewhere. <laughs> so, I, I, so I knew that Reagan was going to come back with uh, something positive. Uh, he said, I don't know any other country that's gone down this far, but I want us to be the first, and that's your challenge. Thanks for having me. Your comments. Start back here. Um, Why don't you identify yourself? I, so my name is Sarah Arnold. The reason I know so much about the Constitution is I was homeschooled and I'm also working on fundraising for an Article 5 pack. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in keeping with the nonpartisan spirit of the Centennial Institute, I wanted to briefly run past you my top five list of least favorite presidents, two of which happen to be Republicans, and I'll give them to you in chronological order and why, because all of it relates to the Constitution. The first is Abraham Lincoln, because he changed the way we look at the United States, from the United States are as a collection of states to the United States is as a collection of the federal government. And I think without that, we would have been able to have Teddy Roosevelt, who set up the national park system, the first largely federalized thing, which gave us rise to Woodrow Wilson, who is probably my least favorite president. Um, all of the things that you talked about are a good example of that. We go into Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who massively expanded the government, and then we go into Jimmy Carter, who massively expanded the government. We would have had Obama had we not had those five before. So I'm curious why more people don't know about what Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt did in reference to expanding the federal government or changing our view of that, um, and also what you think we can do to help start rolling all of this back, because you talked a lot about where, where we need to go, but not necessarily how to get there, so I'm curious what you're You have to buy the book for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, well, first, I have made similar arguments about uh, Lincoln, but it's important to recognize, first of all, he died before he was able to make the major changes. Uh, all right? uh, uh, and he's fighting a civil war, you know? I mean, uh, yes, it's true, you know, he, he, he took control of the telegraph and uh, read the mail, uh, you know, forget about the First Amendment. Uh, but, you know, you're fighting a civil war, I mean, uh, um, and we don't really know where he would have ended up, uh, I don't think. Uh, um, uh, it's clear that that's, uh, uh, the Civil War uh, changed uh, America uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, changed the federal relationship. Uh, but there were some good reasons, too, why uh, that happened. Uh, you know, getting rid of slavery was a positive thing to do. Um, so, uh, and, and you're right about Theodore Roosevelt, but he just pales next to Wilson. Uh, um, how do we come back? We have to realize that the Constitution worked and uh, go back to it. I mean, listen, I'm a nobody. I was in a cabinet room where you made some major decisions. One of you people could be there. Just remember the Tenth Amendment. You don't have to remember anything else. <laughs> if the aim is to return power to the states, would you advocate the repeal of the 17th Amendment in return of the selection of the state votes, uh, U.S. senators for the state legislature? Yeah, I, I think it was a big mistake to change it. It's another big progressive reform. I mean, they uh, uh, almost everything they did was wrong. Uh, um, but I don't know if I'd waste a lot of time. Actually, where is action coming from today? It's all from the state level. I mean, Congress is, is and the president are all deadlocked. Uh, uh, I think we can recreate the states. I, I'd prefer it, obviously, but I, uh, I just don't, wouldn't have it high on my agenda. Well, unfortunately, well, to one extent, they have to exercise their, their rights, uh, and they've got plenty of power. Uh, remember, in some ways, the states are the most powerful. I mean, they created the union. 
All right? They couldn't have done it without the states. Uh, and they broke it up in the Civil War. I mean, the South is right that the name of the correct name of the war should be the war between the states. Uh, 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 but it's much more important that we understand that the reason uh, that uh, the central government can't do it is it just can't do everything. Uh, the great Frederick Hayek, uh, Nobel laureate, uh, wrote in the, the 30s that the problem with trying to uh, uh, run a, a, a government from the center, it's impossible to deal with that complexity. He gives an example. There are 10 to the 46 power, 146 zeros, uh, uh, atoms in our solar system. Now that's a lot of complexity. There is more intercortical connection in one person's mind in one minute than 10 to the 46 power. I mean, that's the degree of complexity. That you, and then you add how many minutes in a day, how many weeks, a day, uh, how many people there are. Uh, I mean, the complexity is impossible. And physics can't deal with that kind of complexity. And we th we're trying to run government like we're running physics. Yeah. Okay. When you said that uh, a lot of the law schools that you've been to, they don't read the Constitution, uh, that made me think, are we losing our ability to think independently? Because you said that the, the, the courts decide everything. It's up to the courts. What do, you, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, when the Tocqueville, did, did, do you read the Tocqueville? Do people know who he is here, the students? Uh, huh? Yeah, I mean, de Tocqueville, and he came over to America. Again, he came over to look at it, and he's trying to find the federal government. He can't find it, all right? Uh, he said, the only place I can find the federal government is in the capital, where the, they have not much going on, and in the hearts of the countrymen. He said, paradoxically, because the government does so little, they love it the more, because it isn't bothering them. Uh, but what made America different to him? He's French, of course. He comes over and he sees what's going on in America. He says, you know, if you want something done in France, you go to the bureaucracy. All right? And the bureaucracy in France is relatively efficient for a bureaucracy. Uh, 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 and, but they clearly have the control. So if you want something done, you go to them. He's, he also studied Britain. Uh, uh, <coughs> and he said, if you want something done in Britain, you go to the aristocracy. Uh, and if you can convince the, the intellectual leaders in the aristocracy, it doesn't matter which party they are, uh, it'll get done. But in America, if you want something done, they do it themselves. Right? And that's what we're missing. We're missing the idea that we can take care of ourselves. And of course, it's very understandable. We've been going 70 years being told that... Uh, What's the greatest piece of political fiction in America? The people still read The Wizard of Oz or see the movie. You know The Wizard of Oz, right? All right? All right. What's The Wizard of Oz about? What? It's a deception. It's, a, it's an allegory of the individual and the state. This Dorothy gets thrown up from middle America, uh, uh, strong uh, uh, middle American values, and goes up and she's in this weird looking place uh, uh, and she's lost. She, she wants to go home. So she asks everybody around, how can I get home? So she says, uh, so they all tell her, you've got to go see the, the great wizard of Oz. He's got all the answers. He can do everything he can solve. I said, all right. So she starts going down the yellow brick road. And who she run into first? Scarecrow? All right. So he runs into the scarecrow. What does the scarecrow want? He wants a brain, right? Well, certainly the wizard should be able to give you a brain. Right? 
So she said, come on, let's go to the wizard and we can get your brain. And she goes down, who's the next one she meets? And Tin Man, what does he want? A heart. Well, certainly the great wizard can give you a heart. So come along with me. And then she runs into the lion and he wants courage and certainly. Uh, huh? So they go down the road. They finally get to see the wizard. They go in uh, the big and impressive uh, palace, a uh, big, uh, enormous uh, idol uh, 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 of the, the wizard. Uh, and the wizard is speaking in great deep tones and very knowledgeable and understanding. Uh, but Dorothy thinking he's not really saying very much about how you get a heart or how you get... Uh, uh, a brain or uh, how you get home and all of a sudden Toto or dog runs over to the side and opens up the screen and what's in there is a little old guy inside there and he's doing this little machine here that makes his voice seem authoritative and strong and that's all there is and you can go to any government bureau in Washington and see the exact same thing. They don't know what to do. They can't give you a heart. They can't give you a brain. They can't give you courage. Some of you older folks may remember Senator uh, uh, Graham of Texas. He was holding a hearing uh, one time for... Uh, overseeing the Department of Education. And he liked to nudge the bureaucrats, uh, and he was pushing this guy. And, the, and the, the education guy finally got so upset, he said, Listen, we know better how to educate your children than you do. And uh, Graham says, You know my children well enough to educate them better than I can? What are their names? They don't know anybody. They sit there and come up with these airy things. Uh, we got to do it ourselves. That's what made America great. Not having somebody else do it for you. So 25 years ago today, I, uh, I woke up to the news of probably one of the most tremendous historic events of my lifetime, the fall of the Berlin Wall that had been happening the night before. And I was actually in Germany at the time and, and experienced that amazing, amazing year. And one of the things that really strikes me is how few of the lessons we have learned about the experience of, of communism and the collapse of that entire system of, of government and, and really philosophy and seem to be trying to, to repeat many of the features of that. And, and it, it, again, it strikes me how little we've learned from history and how there's always people who think that if we just get the right people in charge and, and we just do it better, it wasn't that this, the idea was wrong, it just we didn't execute it correctly. Can you talk a little bit about what it is we can, we can learn from history, why we're not learning enough from history, and, and how it is that you know, we, we've learned all these lessons before, why is it that for crying out loud, we're not applying How about Adam and Eve? Uh, I mean, uh, we're made tough hides. We don't learn very easy, and a lot of times we got to get hit on the head. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, the fact of the matter is, everybody who's serious about it knows we cannot sustain Social Security and especially. Uh, uh, um, uh, Medicare, Medicare, 31 trillion. We don't even know what that is. Uh, uh, unfunded part of it. Uh, um, and yet, you know, we always blame the politicians how bad they are. Who doesn't want you to talk about Social Security and, uh, and Medicare? White-haired people, right? Uh, and but not just them, all right? And, and you know, they plan their lives on it. It's understandable. 
But you could do things like changing the age over a long period of time that wouldn't hurt uh, 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 people that much. Uh, people are living much longer than they were when they started. Uh, um, but it's hard. People don't like to do difficult things, and that's why these things keep getting put off and put off and put off. Uh, uh, but sooner or later, you got to deal with it as uh, uh, right, uh, the Soviet Union had to and East Germany, uh, and, and thank God they came out well. Uh, uh, the other alternative is Weimar Germany, all right? Uh, I mean, the Germans were the most sophisticated people in the, the world uh, uh, at that time, the greatest... Uh, musical and uh, technical and scientific people in the world. They had a, a democracy, admittedly uh, a new one, but a democracy. Uh, um, and yet they turned it over to Hitler. Um, uh, these things can go either way. I mean, that's why I give these talks. I mean, we got to face these problems uh, and uh, and hopefully learn something. Yeah. You forgot your punchline on the Wizard of Oz. My point is they were looking to the government oh, yeah, for the answer. Yeah, go ahead. But, but the, if you don't mind, the punchline no. is that uh, the Scarecrow wanted a brain, but there was no greater intellectual in the Wizard of Oz than the Scarecrow. The Tin Man wanted a heart, but it, throughout the, the book and the film, he had the biggest heart and the greatest love of anybody <laughs> in that film. My point is the answer is already within ourselves, and why should we look to the government? And, and, you know, like the Tocqueville said, you know, Americans took care of things themselves. They didn't need the government. And actually, Dorothy only had to click her heels and she could go back automatically. You know, I, I lived in five different countries initially uh, at the graduate school in uh, New York. Six, I'll make six countries New York. So <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, after... Uh, seeing how much how many billions of dollars we spent to teach them to do and to things for themselves supposedly one of his young trainees came up and he said you know you are the bastion of private free enterprise and freedom and why do you come down here in your, with your government people in the embassy and teach us you know, that's, that's, that's a, a very important point. After World War II, the American zone in uh, western uh, Germany was headed by an American general. Uh, and he was had the revenue, uh, retinue of uh, progressive economists there and all told them what to do. Hitler had put in wage and price control, but that's a good thing under Keynesian economics, so he kept them in there. Uh, they regulated uh, the prices of everything. Now, there happened to be a guy there, I mentioned the name Frederick Hayek, who if you don't know him, uh, your students, you should get to know him. Uh, he's probably the greatest intellect of the 20th century. Uh, um, uh, the guy who was the economic minister under the American commissioner, uh, a guy named Earhart, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, had been taught free, ec uh, free, uh, uh, free market economics. Uh, and uh, he said, listen, they went for like six months or a year, uh, maybe more under the wage and price controls uh, uh, and he, he told the general uh, we got to get rid of them uh, and the general said no well he called his economic advisor and he said no and uh, um, um, Earhart said well I'm going to do it anyway so the general gets on the plane goes back to see the president and make sure he'll back him up uh, to stop him and while he's on the plane, he got rid of the wage and price control. In two months, the economy was thriving. In a year and a half, it was ahead of the victors 
Britain and France in terms of productivity. So you're absolutely right. I mean, our progressives go out and ruin the economies of the rest of the world. But Reagan did change that. When Reagan cut the uh, taxes, uh, it was the first time progressive, the progressive rate had been uh, declined in a, in a democratic country. Uh, uh, Fifty countries followed after him doing that. And many of them did better in this past recession than we did. Do you think the, uh, the corruption in D.C. will ever allow the markets to be free? Like, Reagan did a pretty good job, like the best job, but will it ever happen again? Or It will if we're lucky. Uh, in my experience, you have a year as president to get something done. Now, Obama did it a little more than that, but basically a year. If you have a president that comes in that's determined to change regulation, he can do it relatively easy. Now, it's been a big mistake, in my opinion, to have regulations done by the bureaucracy. It should be done by the legislature. But that's how it's done now, all right? If you get a president in that understands, at least in my opinion, that the main thing holding us back, in the short run at least, is regulation, and he can get rid of them. I mean, the first day Reagan... <coughs> <coughs> was in there, I think we did 60 uh, um, uh, executive orders. Uh, uh, um, uh, and uh, we can do that again. Uh, and I think that alone could at least put the economy on the right track. Uh, uh, we'd still have enormous debts to pay off. But This has been a night when we are reminded that uh, behind the curtain is a phony. <laughs> and before we conclude our uh, reliving of the Wizard of Oz and its parable about why we need to return America to the Constitution and federalism, I just remind you all of one other great line from the Wizard of Oz where uh, she says, I don't think we are in Kansas, Kansas, Kansas anymore. Kansas. We are not because this used to be Kansas. They carved out Colorado territory. Colorado became a state. We are the Centennial State, and hence the Centennial Institute. It's been our honor to have Dr. Don Devine with us tonight. I know he'd be happy to speak with you uh, individually afterward and sign copies of his book, America's Way Back. But with this uh, uh, frosty night and some people having to make their way home across treacherous roads and other students having to tiptoe across campus across treacherous sidewalks, uh, we, should, we should adjourn now and please join me in thanking very, very warmly our guest, Dr. <laughs>